Hi, welcome to the signal pad. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. This is an Agilent E5052A, which is a signal source analyzer. Now, if you haven't seen my video on phase noise, that would be a good one to watch before this one. There I describe what phase noise is from a theoretical point of view, its implications on various applications, how it's measured, and even some of the more advanced measurement techniques that an instrument like this uses, which is cross-correlation techniques. In short, the cross-correlation technique allows this instrument to measure phase noise below its own internal synthesizer phase noise, which is interesting. And if you watch that video, you'll see exactly how that is done. Now, this unit is defective, even though it's actually quite old. I, the, what, the video that I did on the phase noise, I took apart and showed you what's inside of the E5052B, which is the follow-up on this one. But I think they're very, very similar. That one doesn't have a floppy, for example, and might be some improvements of the internal circuits. So let's go ahead and turn this on and see what kind of fault it has. Even though it's an old instrument, these are extremely valuable and definitely worth repairing. So let's take a look. Well, first thing first, it's complaining that the CMOS battery is dead. Not surprising, these motherboards are quite old. We can fix that later. And by the way, the screen looks really reflective, but it's actually not. It does have a matte finish. The angle is just really straight on. I think it makes it look worse than it is. So let's do some basic measurements. Right now we're in phase noise measurement mode, as you can see, and we're measuring gibberish because there's nothing connected. The input has no power going into it and it says insufficient RF level, which is correct. Now I have the input of the instrument connected to the Rodenshaw's SMB V100B which itself is a very clean synthesizer. I'm going to enable the output at one gigahertz. Here we go. So there it is, there's a one gigahertz tone coming in, zero dBm, and you can see the carrier has been detected automatically, very close to one gigahertz. That's to be expected because both of these instruments have oven control crystal oscillators. So they should be in pretty good agreement, which they are. Now I haven't set up the phase noise measurement. We just want to do some preliminary testing. Now if you look at the power here, it says that the power is minus four dBm. It does give us a reasonably good shape of the phase noise. It's probably correct. But if you look at the minus four dBm, that's almost certainly wrong because I have a very good cable connecting the Roden Shorts and the Agilent here. And that cable may have a dB of loss at worst at one gigahertz, but it's not gonna have four dB of loss. So let's change the frequency and see what happens. I go up by hundred megahertz and look at that. I just went up by hundred megahertz. It got detected perfectly, but the power already changed by quite a bit. And this cable does not have these kind of issues. So something is certainly wrong. Now, if I change the frequency, let's go all the way to, let's say two and a half gigahertz. Yep, if the frequency is being detected, no, no problem. If I go all the way to 6 gigahertz, which is the highest the Roden Shores can do, and you can see it's almost perfectly 6 gigahertz, and the power is still minus 3 dBm. Let's go the other way. Let's go down to, let's say, 900 megahertz. Yeah, look at that. At 900 megahertz, it says it's minus 5 dBm. That's wrong. 800 is now minus 9 dBm, minus 6, 9 again, now minus 13 at 500, minus 16 at 400. Yeah, this is bad. Okay, so there is something wrong here. Now, you may be tempted to say that, well, down conversion has an issue, but this instrument actually measures frequency, power, and phase noise in three completely different ways. It's not like a regular spectrum analyzer. The architecture is quite different. We will go over it very briefly. So these are separated. In some ways, makes it a lot easier to debug this particular problem. So there's some subtleties there we need to take care of. There are also front-end attenuators, but I don't think the front-end attenuator is an issue in this case because is changing widely between different frequencies. But we can see if the attenuator works. So let me set it to one gigahertz. And actually ch testing the attenuator is really not that meaningful anyway, because the attenuator is not in the path of the power detection. But anyway, you will see that in a second. So here's 5 dB. If I change it to zero, you can see that it makes absolutely no difference in the power measurement. This is not even in the path. Yeah, it has no effect. The phase noise obviously changes, because the amount of power arriving at a phase noise measurement part of the system does change, but not for the power detection. It does it in a very different way. So let's go to the block diagram so we can explain this, so it will give us some guidance on how to debug it. So it turns out that there is a service manual for the E5052A, but unfortunately there are no block diagrams in it and no real information about the internal architecture of the assemblies. I guess they really wanted to keep these things a secret. But there is an instrument block diagram for the E5052B, which is going to be good enough for us to work on, as I think, as I said, they're very similar. So here's the RF input coming in from 10 megahertz to 7 gigahertz. It's going to get split into two using this resistive splitter. One goes down and one goes up. Let's worry about the downside a little bit later. The signal going to the top is split once again into two paths, one path going in here and the other path going in here. And if you look in the front of the instrument, there's actually two loopbacks. Those are these two loopbacks. So you have two completely independent 
inputs now into this instrument. And this is the attenuator that we were changing. And you can see once you enter the instrument from the front panel, everything after this path is now replicated. There's two completely independent down converters, two fully independent synthesizers, LO2 and LO1, generating 10 megahertz to 7 gigahertz to down convert the signal into baseband. Now even the reference for these synthesizers, the oven controlled crystal references, are from two different vendors and even mounted perpendicular inside of the chassis so that vibration effects and even gravity effects become uncorrelated. It's really important that these two down conversions are uncorrelated because that information is used to subtract their effect from the original signal. The signal here and here, which is from the input, are completely correlated. But the signal afterwards is now has two effects on top of each other, the effect of the LOs and the effect of the original signal. And by looking at this DSP after they're digitized, you can subtract the uncorrelated from the correlated effect and therefore go well below the phase noise of LO2 and LO1, which is pretty clever. This is a pretty old technique and there have been improvements on this since this was originally invented. Now if you look at the other path down here, we take the signal and we split it to the bottom side and we go through these two diodes, which are of course positive and negative peak detectors. And these two positive and negative peak detectors tell you the maximum and minimum value of the signal and you can digitize that to find out the input power. And therefore the power is measured using this part of the circuit and it has nothing to do with the top, which is very helpful because this is where the complication actually is in terms of the design. And then afterwards, we have a data converter here. It's low speed ADC, which is going to digitize the value of that. There's also a switch in front of this A to D, allowing it to digitize also the temperature monitor. This temperature monitor is probably coupled to these detectors so that the temperature can be canceled out. And as the temperature inside of the unit changes, you can correct for that and calibrate for that. Now, the signal coming from here is also tapped off, it looks like, and it goes through a divider comes down and goes through a counter. So indeed they're tapping off a little bit of power over here in order to run this counter so they can measure the frequency as well. And this counter is of course comparing it against the internal reference itself. So we have three separate measurements being done. The phase noise up here, the frequency over here, and the power down here. And this is what I was saying is that it's a little bit of a red herring try to chase attenuators up here because they have nothing to do with the power measurement. We should be really focusing in this area of the instrument to figure this out. There's also some very low voltage and very, uh, very low noise and very accurate uh, sources here so used to measure BCOs. We don't have to worry about that here, but that's also available. So now that we understand this, we can go back and take it apart and find every one of these components so we see where we need to pay attention to. All right, so here's the top of the instrument. This is basically all the PC stuff, we have just a basic power supply. We have the hard drive, which definitely needs to be imaged and replaced, hopefully replaced with an SSD because it's most likely end of life. And we have the motherboard underneath. I think by removing this, we should be able to change the battery of the motherboard so that error with the CMOS dying goes away. That should be definitely easy to do. All the actual RF measurement is on the other side and the PC and the RF are separated by a plate in between them so there's no noise coupling to them anyway. So let's change the battery before we go to the RF. And here's our CMOS battery all the way down there. Should be pretty easy to replace. And from the bottom of the instrument we can see the signal path, no pun intended, going from the RF input. So here's the RF input coming in goes into this block, which I think is a DC block. Then it goes into a power splitter, the first one in the chain that we saw in the block diagram too. On the right side, we go into another power splitter, and then we get two signals coming out, which go to the front of the instrument and then back in, going to the two separate attenuators. And after that, they go both bend in and go to the other side, where we have all the other down conversion. But on the other side of the resistive splitter, we go into another power splitter once again, and this time we have the positive and the negative detectors as two separate SMA based components, which is nice, easy to find them. And then we have the temperature sensor right over here. I'm not so sure how well this is thermally coupled, but I think it's just in the proximity, probably good enough. And then we have the two analog signals coming from the two detectors going into the board, where I think that the A to D and the amplifier is underneath here. We also have another signal, which is the frequency divided, divided signal, I believe, which goes into further divisions probably underneath this cage as well. So really all the signals we need to take a look at are here, which is super convenient, and we should be able to quickly measure that. So if I unplug these two, 
and digitize them myself, I should be able to measure exactly the detector output coming from here and seeing if they make any sense as a function of the input power and as a function of the input frequency and see if we can detect the problem or not. And if that problem is, for example, one of these detectors being bad, we should be able to find that pretty quickly. If these produce perfectly good signals across all powers and frequency, then the problem could be underneath this. Could be the digitizer or the amplifier. We'll have to dig in further. So let me set that up. Okay, so let's do some proper tests on these detectors. So I have the input coming in, again from the Rodin Shores SMBV100B. We're going to apply a low frequency AM modulation of that signal. So basically the amplitude of the signal is going to shrink and grow, shrink and grow at a low frequency. That's perfect for the detectors to follow the peaks, the negative and the positive peaks of that signal. That's going to be interesting. So I have taken the two outputs of the detectors. You can see I've disconnected them from the main body of the PCB. And these two are now going to the channel 1 and channel 3 of the Roden Shores MXO4 series. Now this is a 12-bit ADC-based instrument with a very low noise and high dynamic range. Perfect to look at the detector signals which are unamplified. We're looking at the raw signal. So if I turn the instrument on, we should be able to see the AM modulation envelope from the detectors. All right, here we go. I'm going to turn the RF power on. And look at that. That looks pretty good. So here's the positive and the negative detectors and they look pretty symmetric and they look pretty good. So I'm a little bit puzzled now. So this is a frequency at one gigahertz. Let's change the frequency like we did with the actual instrument. I'm going higher. Oh, the amplitude is not stable at all. So right now this is two gigahertz. Let's go back down below one gig. Yeah, there's something going on. So here's 800 megahertz. You can see the amplitude is shrunk so much. Wow, this is 500 megahertz and it is completely gone. This is bizarre. But the detectors are giving very nice symmetric signals. I'm beginning to think the problem is not with the detectors, which would be unusual. But we have to now go a little bit earlier in the chain and see what the issue is. So here's 300 megahertz. 200 megahertz becomes large again. Very unusual. Okay, let's change the setup and measure some S parameters of the entire front end. See if we can find the issue. So we looked at the signal here and here, the output of the detectors, these two cables, and they were symmetric, but they still showed that frequency dependent issue. So we should step back one and measure perhaps here and see if the S parameter from here to here looks good. Now this side is, should be terminated normally, so that shouldn't be an issue. It's this side that's the, actually the problem. And let's find out if this has a nice flat frequency response as we expect. It is possible that someone put too much power in here and partially damage these resistors in this divider here. And that could explain the problem we're seeing. If the resistors are partially damaged, you could see that frequency response potentially. But it's a little bit puzzling nonetheless. But let's measure here. And for that measurement, we can simply just use the ZNL20. We'll connect port 1 to the input of the instrument and port 2 over here to the output side of this divider. And that will give us the S parameter of the front end. Let's see how that looks. Well, I was just about to remove this cable so we can measure the S parameter here. And look at what I found. Look at that. That connector is completely broken from that power divider circuit. And that, of course, explains the frequency response because you don't know what kind of connection that is making. It could have notches in its frequency response, which is what we were seeing. So yeah, no, no need to measure the S parameter right now. We just have to remove this and see if this is repairable at all. Otherwise, we'll have to find a replacement for it. And here's our divider module. This is, of course, fully passive. And yeah, there's something definitely going on with that. These are nice and solid. I think we're going to disassemble it a little bit more. I didn't disconnect this from here for obvious reasons because there is a lot of torque on this. If I twist that, I'm worried that I will do more damage. So let's completely disassemble it before we take any more action. All right, so let's see what we have here. So this is where the connector has separated. And you can see that it looks like we might have had some cold solder. So that connector wasn't really well soldered down and it must have failed over time. And I can clean this up a little bit. And I think this is, should be easily repairable. There's nothing unusual about this kind of power divider. It's actually just a resistive divider. I'll show you the other side in a second. And this is where that was. So yeah, there's a bit of a cold solder joint in here. But I think we should be able to fix that. And on the other side of this, of course, we have our resistive divider. No problem here. This only needs to work up to 7 gigahertz, so it's fairly low frequency anyway. There is nonetheless still a little bit of matching. You can see they have added a tiny bit of series inductance over here to absorb the capacitance of the surface mount components and match it nicely over the broadband. I like the transition, this coaxial vertical trans transition. There's a lot of vias around there. Nicely done. Yeah, so I think I'm just going to try and reflow this very carefully, obviously, not to damage the connector. 
But uh, yeah, then we will measure its S parameters. If the S parameter of this looks good, I think this might fix it. No more other minor point. If you look at this solder joint versus this one and this one, you can clearly see that there is a very big difference. So this problem must have originated from the factory because yeah, this is clearly not, not soldered correctly and there's a dip in it. And that's what probably has slowly caused it to fail. Maybe some uneven heating of this entire structure and that would explain this problem and over vibration and time, yeah, eventually it fails. So I think that the reflow went fairly well and the connection looks really good. So now we should be able to close this back up. I cleaned it up as much as I could. You can see the cavity in the back piece over there to ensure that you're not coupling to these traces and make them essentially as independent as possible. So let's reassemble this and now we can measure its S parameter by itself. And if that looks good, then we should be able to put it back. And here's our S parameter setup, very simple. We're going to use the Roden Short Network Analyzer. Now, it doesn't matter which two ports I use for measurement. And this was the damaged port, which was the common port, the way it was set up in the instrument. So we have port 1 here and port 2 here, and the unused port is terminated. Now, this is a resistive divider, so of course all the ports need to be 50 ohm terminated. All resist, all dividers require that. And at the same time, because it's resistive, we're going to lose half of our power inside of those resistors. The benefit is that this is broadband and it works down to DC, although it's not really used down to DC in this instrument. As a result, we expect from here to here to have an S21 of nominally about minus 6, and it will be the same from here to here. Let's take a look. And here's the response, and it looks good. This is near DC. This is 8.5 gigahertz, and of course, this is wider than the instrument itself is supposed to do, but nonetheless, we can measure up to 8.5 and we can see that the loss is about minus 6.3 if I go down this knob definitely needs acceleration it doesn't have it so I'm gonna have to turn it a lot to move that marker forward and the marker over here this is a 1 dB per scale so we do have a little bit of additional loss right down the middle but that doesn't really matter and then you can see it picks up again and I bet that network with a little bit of inductance is to compensate and that's how they get this additional peaking towards the end but at the lowest point we're about minus 6.7 or so and that of course can be calibrated that's part of the calibration of the instrument across power so i think it looks good we should put it back in the unit and try it out and all back together nice and solid here we go the moment of truth i have the synthesizer set to 200 megahertz and 0 dbm let's enable and nice we're reading minus 0 0.3 dBm, which is pretty good. Let's go, here's 300, 400, 500, 700, 800. So at 800, it was used to read minus 17 or 15. So it's working now. Here's a gigahertz. Nice, let's go to two gigahertz. Good, now this is not just a cable loss. Here's three gigahertz. And four gigahertz. Five gigahertz and 6 gigahertz yeah so it definitely needs to be recalibrated i think that power gradient is definitely going to have to be readjusted but it looks good the main problem where it was just giving us completely garbage result that definitely has been addressed which is very good so now the only other thing to do is to measure phase noise with a very very low phase noise source just to make sure that part of it also works and then we can call it a success and here I'm using the Signal Hound PNCS1, which is a 1 gigahertz reference, precisely for this kind of verification, ultra low phase noise source. And here I'm running 30 correlations, starting from 10 hertz all the way to 40 megahertz. Now, starting from 10 hertz and running 30 correlations, you can see how slowly this thing actually goes and does one round of correlations, but you need to do that if you want to see the true phase noise of this source, especially for frequencies below 10 kilohertz and offsets, and it takes a long time. Now you look at the performance of this, at 1 kilohertz offset, we're sitting almost at minus 140 dBc per hertz, which is really quite good. And at 1 megahertz, we're already at minus 150. And there is a soft filter inside of the PNCS1. And above about 20 megahertz or so, it really cuts out everything else. And there is literally nothing left. And we're sitting at minus 167 dBc per hertz. It's really, really quite clean. Integrated jitter from 20 kilohertz to 20 megahertz. You can see it's about 24 femtosecond, which is also very good. And that's exactly what you need in order to be able to test the performance of something like the E5052A. Now, keep in mind that if I connect the PNCS to a regular spectrum analyzer, you will not see these results at lower frequencies, especially because you would be simply measuring the spectrum analyzer's internal phase noise, and that's exactly what that instrument is for. But this one, it can do cross-correlation, go well, well below that, although it is slow. For a modern 
let's say, phase noise analyzer, you can go down to minus 180, 185 dBc per hertz, which is really quite impressive. But nonetheless, I think the E5052A is still an excellent instrument, and it seems to be fully functional. And the power measurement here, although it's a little bit obscured by the cursor there, it says minus 9.8, uh, plus 9.8 or so, which is also correct. That source is supposed to put out about 10 dBm. So I think, yeah, I think it all works. Very nice. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this repair. I'm going to put the cover back on and it will be ready to get back to all tests who loaned this to me for this repair video. I'm always grateful for that. And let me know what you think in the comment section. And even though the problem itself wasn't fundamentally very difficult to fix, you still need to know where to look. And the analysis of the block diagram, the symptoms, that's part of the repair process. And I hope you enjoyed that. I'll see you next time.